Welcome to the weekend must watch here on the Intercut Podcast channel, where we wade our way through the week in theater streaming and on demand. I am your co host, Zachary Shevich, and joining me, spending 12 hours a day at the music box, it's Arturo Zurita. I don't even think they'll allow you for 12 hours at the music box, but between the music <laughs> box, the River East Theater, yeah, it's been nothing but screening after screening after screening. After coming back from New York, there is no sleep for the movie watcher. Yeah, fall season, fall festival season, the it, leading into award season, there's just no rest. It's movies all day, every day, wink, and still... You blink, boom, <laughs> you just missed like five countries and their submissions because there's only one film festival who's playing them. Yeah. And then you're done, and then it becomes like that fifth one that gets nominated for international film that no one's heard of. They're like, who saw mm -hmm. this? And like, it played in one week in September. But, uh, yeah, we're on it. We've been trying to catch as many. <laughs> Zach finished up New York, and he got mm -hmm. like, probably one of the best weeks was that third week, and that's exactly when I dipped over here. Uh, <laughs> some of those will be playing over here in Chicago. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, th there were still some movies that came out this weekend as well. One big one that just refuses to die and has people practically <laughs> killing each other over it. Yeah, uh, we will get into the, all the controversy around uh, this weekend's big horror release soon, but we haven't really been doing a huge amount of watching stuff outside of film festivals, so uh, there's stuff like The Watcher and stuff like Dahmer and stuff like Rosaline that we just really haven't found the time for we've been knee deep trying to find this year's Luna, lunana yak a, a yak in the classroom <laughs> or whatever um yes, thanks for all of you who are letting us know what you've been watching uh there's a lot of good stuff out there we will get to it all soon we'll get back into the regular flow of things probably next week maybe the week after we still are going to come back no next problem. week yeah, definitely remember for sure. We're definitely going to come back next week and do a full rundown of what I saw in New York, what uh, Arturo saw in Chicago. Hopefully we'll bring on a, a fun guest to also join us for some of the fall film festival movies. Uh, but this week, we only got one really big what we're watching. And I think it's what most people who go to movie theaters were watching this weekend. Halloween wow. ends. Uh, yeah, that's true. The, it's, luckily, it's, it is available on Peacock. That's how I watched it because I was not going to drag myself to the theater for the third David Gordon Green Halloween movie. Uh, I have not really felt that strongly about the first two, and I, I didn't expect to feel too strongly about this one. Lo and behold, the internet is, is just very, very divided over this decidedly different installment in the... Uh, latest halloween trilogy if that's what we want to call it halloween ends returns uh to the events following halloween in 2018 uh you have laurie strode continuing to preach the concern of michael myers uh while uh the townsfolk all blame her for holding on to her her uh her obsession with him uh but there are a lot of ways in which this Halloween movie, I think, differs from the previous ones. Art, what was your reaction to actually catching Halloween Ends? Uh, I got to catch this one in Dolby. I caught the last one in Dolby as well. I Last one was a part of the Chicago Fest. This time I was there for the Chicago Fest. I'm like, let me sneak this in before I go see Carson's debut short film. Uh, <laughs> and look, Shout I, out Dirtbag. Dolby delivers. If you're watching this for the jump scares and the bumps in the night, the score and I think is the one thing that's united everybody. It's still just as great uh, with Carpenter coming back to do it. If the first movie was practically a reboot, the Halloween 2018 one, coming in to kind of uh, redefine the story, having the characters literally tell you, oh, yeah, everything you knew about them being like siblings, it wasn't really that. We're readjusting the story. Two, I'm still not the biggest fan of, but it definitely hones in on the kills. The kills there are so over the top that it may be too much. The themes, mm -hmm. though, were a little heavy-handed. It's like, oh, this is what you know about COVID and, like, mass people coming in. Okay, It's not fully there, but I see you went fully in on the kills. This time around, I think he goes fully in on the themes and kind of leaves the kills, which aren't too bad. Mm -hmm. Almost as cameos, depending on who it is that you come to see a Halloween movie for. Thematically, though, 
I know this is where people are kind of uh, shifted at. They're, they're kind of divided because they don't like the approach that was taken for this movie specifically for Michael Myers. Yeah. I, don't like I mean, it's it it's a movie. It's a Halloween movie that really, really sidelines the Michael Myers character. Like he's yeah, easily, yeah. not he's even sure. the yeah, he's like not even the biggest evil threat. In the movie, oh, there's some goofy stuff. They disrespect them kind of. I, I heard some people venting about the movie and things that they do with Michael Myers with certain character interactions that he has. And I was like, yeah, it's kind of pathetic. And it, there are some points without getting into full spoilers, right? That it was going to be a rom com with Michael Myers or a father son <laughs> type uh, scenario with him. But, yeah. Uh, for the most part, I think the issue that a lot of people have, and this is the question I have to give you. Do you really take the ends seriously? This is what really flabbergasted me at the theater. People were like, this is really how it all ends? This is how they lay under arrest? I'm like, honey, there's one thing Kills taught you is that this thing will never die. And no matter how they try to change their lore or story, in this trilogy, after trying to fix the, like, 20-something films, they still kind of change the lore in every single movie? Yep. This yep. isn't going anywhere. This is just like your 007. This is just like your Friday the 13th. This is just like every other franchise. This is the end of this Blumhouse Laurie Strode trilogy. Mm -hmm. That's it. They're going to bring him back eventually. Uh, so I don't know if yeah. you actually felt sitting there at your, at your, in your couch watching Peacock that this was the end of Michael Myers. But some people really think this is his farewell. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely the end of something. I mean, I don't know if, if I even want to use the word definitely. That sounds a little bit too definitive for me. But, like, it feels like the end of something, whether that is, like, just the David Gordon Green uh, version of the story, whether that is, like, Jamie Lee Curtis's involvement in these stories and, like you said, the Laurie Strode character. I could see all those things ending, but the franchise itself the idea of this like masked killer coming after you know babysitters and teenagers that that's never gonna end it's it's too easy of a of a money grab for them right like mm -hmm. even if you want to like spin it off and it's like all right now it's about Corey or something <laughs> like sure well, sure the idea of like it's evil spreading that's what i yeah. like thematically about the movie the idea that you can look back and see what causes someone to become this sort of evil and can you fight it can you uh, edge somebody on and then cock block at the same time like mm -hmm. Lori likes to do in this movie? Um, but it, it's I don't if there's one thing that Halloween will never Halloween will never die really is the way that I see it. And this is just uh, a swing for the fences, if anything, from David Gordon Green, where I do feel like he changed a lot. The first mm -hmm. still I don't know if you remember the first images from Halloween ends was him coming out of the red line in Chicago. Hmm. Where's that movie? <laughs> yeah. Not in this one, at least. Not in this one. I feel like a lot was rewritten. I don't mind as much what was rewritten, but you could tell with a lot of the mistakes that they have here and there uh, and what a lot of people have issues with that I feel that there was a big rewrite that had happened and they were going to take them to other places and it just, I don't know, it didn't pan out that way. So yeah. I'd be very curious to see deleted scenes or alternative uh, scripts that they had. You don't them. sound like you're you're too, too down on the movie, though, at least oh, no, compared no, 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 maybe no. to the other David Gordon Green ones. Look, I like it more than Kills. I don't I can't yeah. say that I like it more than the 2018 one, but like I said, if Kills really delivered on the violence, this delivers more on its themes and what Halloween, what what being a survivor really is, which is one thing that I really like that was paralleled between the characters of Lori and then uh, this new character of Corey, who mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people have a problem with. Uh, yeah. I, I feel like the one review I've been seeing thrown around by everybody is like, oh, this is one of those movies where in 10 years it's going to be a classic. And I'm like, yeah, but where are you standing on it now? I don't want to hear in 10 years you switch your side, but right now you don't like it. Uh, I think there's too many problems with it to say that this is going to be like a, a misjudged classic. But yeah. I think that, again, thematically, it does stuff where you could tell that Gordon uh, Green really understands the franchise. Yeah. He does things that other people may not like. He went at it from the approach of, like, what are the ripple effects that happens in this town? And I think he covers that town aspect and the, and the hysteria way better than he did in uh, Kills. Yeah, I mean, I think some of the Oops, stuff Michael. is still... <laughs> some of the some of the stuff about, like, you know, preconceived notions and, you know, judging people and that sort of leading them further away from society, it still comes across a bit heavy-handed. But for me... I actually kind of feel like ends works better than Halloween 2018 or kills, really? at least for me. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to go all the way and say like, I thought this movie was good. 
I don't really think any of the Halloween movies are good. Like I'm maybe I'm like a a, a Halloween trilogy. Or are you talking about Halloween? Like, I'm talking about I'm talking about Halloween going back to John Carpenter, man. Like I've just never really hey. vibed with Michael Myers as a horror villain. H two O, and like maybe that just sort of makes me like uh not somebody who who should pass judgment on these types of movies but like at least there was sort of like some stuff going on here some ideas i th- when it became like you said almost like a father son thing i thought that was hilarious um I, to me, yeah i mean there's just like a i think the campiness worked a little bit more for me here than it normally does and i don't know if a lot of these movies are very campy but like I don't know. There, there's like a an absurd quality to some of it, especially like how things kick off are are, are so extreme. It's I love the intro. It, I yeah, the it's kind of great. Great. It's yeah. kind of great. And like honestly, the worst thing about this, I guess, is that like it doesn't really feel like a Halloween Mike Myers movie. But that's not what I I look for anyway because I don't enjoy those. So I had a decent time with this one. I don't think it was good, but. I, I I went into it expecting to hate it, and I I didn't. Mm-hmm. I had a pretty pretty solid time with it. Uh, I don't think that in terms of the kills, it delivers uh, and respects Michael Myers for a Halloween ends type movie. <laughs> but I think that it sets the ball rolling for what the future could hold in terms of Halloween projects. Uh, I, totally. I don't think Blumhouse is going to continue with it. I think they're done with it. Even though he's now like the, the beginning of their logo. The, the new Blumhouse logo begins with right. Out in the Woods. But, uh, hey, I don't know. Give Green a fourth one. Maybe that'll be it. The fourth time's the charm. <laughs> uh, I All right. I recommend some other horror movies that are out there. Piggy, which we caught at yeah. Science, is now out on VOD, if I'm not mistaken. There's also a short film that goes with that. So if you were curious on yeah. uh, another type of slasher movie where a guy comes in and the young woman who's been getting picked on <laughs> realizes, you know what? I might side with the serial killer on this one because right. those bullies have never done me well. Piggy I saw some VOD. I saw some inner cuties were shouting out the short film too. So, uh, I yeah, the short film's crazier. Yeah, exactly. So just maybe like watch that one first. Minutes of condensed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another one is Bitch Ass, which I have not seen, but I wanted to catch it at South by. It is now out. That is one that I'm definitely going to have on my radar to catch, uh, especially before. Uh, I mean, I guess we are, so there's no before. We are in spooky season, so there's no better Exactly. Uh, I know that uh, Todd, original Candyman himself, is in this to some degree. So yeah. uh, with a name like that, it's on my radar. But uh, definitely the one that I would recommend, we had talked about Deadstream at South By. We mentioned mm-hmm. it a couple weeks ago for Shudder. But there is another South By pick called Sissy. I think it's a really good double feature with Deadstream. Sissy is also an influencer who's vlogging herself and realizing that Maybe a lot of her friendships that she thought of when she was younger weren't destroyed because of somebody else coming in, but maybe because of her own personal background that she may have. I thought this was a really uh, interesting movie that, again, with Deadstream, go really hand in hand in terms of influencers and the influence that they have on people uh, before fixing themselves. So, uh, decent week in horror if you're not just going to theaters for Halloween. Yeah. There's a lot of other stuff out there. I haven't seen Terrifier yet either. I don't know if you heard about that. People coming out of the theater fainting. Yeah. Uh, that sounds like maybe even a little bit more extreme than I want to go, but I, I, <laughs> uh, my buddy, I think it's out of theaters. My buddy was saying that he thinks it's the most fucked up thing that's ever played in an AMC, and from the sounds of it, it might be more than the Nicole Kidman ad. All right. <laughs> uh, we got a question from Jackson in the stream asking us, "What do we think about David Gordon Green?" essentially doing an exorcist trilogy he's been announced as uh the next helmer of whatever comes for the exorcist i think he would have done a better exorcist trilogy i don't think any of these stuff should be touched but i think he would have done a better exorcist trilogy than he would have done a um halloween and we've seen his halloween Mm -hmm. right yeah Uh, i think he would have approached this better but i don't know about you i've seen Michael Myers as a franchise. I've never really seen The Exorcist as a, as a franchise. franchise. I know yeah. they have a TV series. I know there's a sequel. I don't care. Yeah. Like, to me, it's just The Exorcist, and everybody else is just trying to remake it. But it's like, it's just one. Everybody knows there's different Halloweens, and, oh, this is the outing where Michael does this. To me, it's just like, nah, it's the little girl spinning her head, and, like, everything else has been whatever. I, I don't yeah. mind they do The Exorcism of Emily, Jane, Watson, whatever, the, whatever they do. But, like, I've never understood remaking The Exorcist. Yeah, I kind of like, you know, if you're going to 
say like oh i want to watch some slasher films like there are probably several halloweens that might be like in contention but like if you want to watch like an exorcism movie it's like it's the exorcist you don't watch the the cheap knockoffs of it so yeah i I don't know um i think i don't really i'd like david gordon green to do other things to be honest because i don't i don't love him as a horror director but particularly this like yeah yeah that too that too um so i i don't know um david gordon green's not the worst director but just doesn't really seem like the kind of project i would like for him you want to know what his best projects have been this year Appearing as a cameo, as a director, as himself in uh, Way to Mass the Talent, and then yep. appearing again in another movie that we caught in New York that I don't want to spoil in case it's like a cameo. <laughs> he was a very interesting character uh, in one of the New York selections that we saw this year as well. So uh, I think his uh, his cameos have been uh, a lot more nor- noteworthy than than his movies. Definitely. All right, so uh, those are our thoughts on Halloween ends. Let us, let us know what you think. Uh, Art, we only got you for a little bit of time because you are still in the midst of the Chicago International Coming Film right Festival. Back. You want to talk at all about your experience there so far? Any any yeah, highlights? About that. Uh, so the Chicago Film Fest is happening right now. As one of the directors put it, uh, there was one screening for a little movie called, and I had seen it at Tribeca as well. It is called The Year Between. Uh, directed Ooh. by Alex Heller. That one played at Tribeca, and I very much enjoyed it. Alina's a really big fan of her short. I'm blanking on the name of it, but she, she really like Grizzlies, I think is the name of the short. Mm. So we decided to go to a screening where she was going to be there, and then she's like, you know the thing about the Chicago International Film Festival is that it's just a festival in a town where people could just come and buy a ticket. It's not like Sundance where it's remote or South By where you can live in Austin yeah. Did you buy a $1,000 pass. There are right. individual tickets here. There's a nice little rush line where you could go get these tickets. They have a daily deal for 10 bucks, And she's staring out at the crowd going like, this is a story about my life, and I can see my dean is right there. <laughs> my classmates <laughs> are right there. All the people who I know are there. Uh, it's been a, a, a really fun festival. I, I've been coming to this festival since 2017. Whenever La La Land came out, I dropped $50 to go see the premiere of that, <laughs> and, and the boy was there too. Um, this year, we've been able to have full press access to go in on a daily basis. They've been having screenings at the Music Box, where we saw Sick, the opening night film of this year, which I thought uh, was pretty decent. You caught this one in Toronto. Yeah. And it is the new one by the writer of the original screen. So it's got a Evan lot of- Williamson, I believe. Yes, sir. It yeah. Has a lot of those slasher tropes that it tries to play on, but with a little bit of a COVID edge. Um and it, and it works for the most part. You know, there are elements to it where it still falls on those cliches. But I think what it was going for was still a very enjoyable time. And seeing a horror movie at the Music Box is always one of the one of the best things to do if you're in Chicago on a late night screening. It also started really late, so that was like a very late night screening. Um, but that was one to have on your radar. I don't necessarily know the date to this one, but pretty decent cast. Um, uh, besides the Music Box, like I said, everything's been hosted at AMC River East. So as long as you can get there... There are movies from 12 o'clock all the way up until 10 p.m. And uh, it's just been me and the Alina and I and the elderly ladies who go in there. You know, they, we got the little chart of who goes to the Chicago International Film Festival. And it's just like Broadway. It's all of the all of the elderly <laughs> folk who are there watching these movies with us. Mm-hmm. But, um, there's a big emphasis on the I international plan. Seventy five is Japan submission. I had the chance to catch it here and that one packs a punch. Amanda talked about that one being a movie where Japan has uh, had problems with their elderly. And in so they come up with plan. Seventy five. Once you're seventy five, the government gives you a thousand dollars and then they off you. The Great <laughs> Silence is another movie. I'm not sure if this is a submission, um, but it, it's about two siblings, one who has become a nun and a brother who comes back right before she takes her big vow to reveal all these secrets about her. We just came out of Close last night. Yeah. Which is a Belgian submission, and that was the hottest screening, not just because like tickets were selling, but it was steaming in there. People were crying immediately as their tears came out. They evaporated. This was one that I know premiered at Cannes, and I believe Amanda got to see it over there. And there's been so much hype. We were at New York, and they were sending special screening invites to go see this as well. And this is the story of two really close friends who, uh, as the title suggests, may be too close once they enter uh, elementary school, I want to say. And everyone keeps noting that. So there's almost like this drift that happens. And it's just, a re- literally, it's just the story of their relationship. Um, and it's, 
it, it slowly just gets at you. And I think that the children, the performance, performers in this movie were absolutely fantastic. This is one to have on your radar. And I believe may end up being one of the five that ends yeah. up uh, as, a, as a submission for sure. That um, seems to be the buzz on it right now, that it is one of those leading contenders for the best international feature at the... Uh, yeah at the oscars i'm i'm very excited to try and uh it's catch really this good. one and there's a bunch of other ones that i'll be catching that are submissions today we'll be catching another one called beast excuse me i know that there's a lot of other uh international submissions that have gone in uh trying to catch as many before the end of the year but some of the other ones would be uh how to blow up a pipeline that i did have the chance to catch yeah getting to it and uh this is adrenaline from beginning to end they don't mm -hmm. stop uh, they just keep pumping at you. Um, this comes from the director, as Zach had said, who had done Cam over on Netflix. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is just a completely different movie. This is one where you're almost seeing these different vignettes of a group of young, as it says right there, environmental activists who are trying to come together to prevent or to make a message about this pipeline because they've yeah. all been affected in different ways. And the, the movie unfolds in a way where you're seeing their backstories and what brought them all together. And it was, it was pretty solid. I wasn't indoctrinated immediately to go to <laughs> eco terrorism just yet. Uh, but it is one that I have on my radar to rewatch and they even showcase the book that it's based off in the movie. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to see, uh, check out the book without, I don't know, ending up on a list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. You also had a Q and a, and I wish I, I wish they recorded the Q and a's in Chicago because, uh, I, I'd be very curious to see what he had to say about it. Um, but yeah, that, that's another one to add. Some on of your highlights. Are. Yeah, a lot of the highlights that I had. Monica was another really good one that caught, caught us by surprise. Beautiful cinematography of a woman who comes back home as uh, her mother is, is getting more ill. And I think what it hits you with, it's been interesting to see the reception on that one. But I, I don't want to spoil it, but I think in spoiling it is also part of what the movie's trying to say. We'll have to have a discussion once you see Monica, but a okay, very gorgeous-looking movie to have on your radar. Um, and Noise, which was probably the most recent one that we've caught. This one comes out of Mexico, and I know Netflix hmm. already picked it up, and I, I see it as this, this trio of movies from these past years from non-identifying features that we caught at Sundance. That may be HBO, but it could be Netflix. Um, last year, Prayers for the Stolen, which is also on Netflix and played at Chicago. And then this one, Noise, also known as Rido in Spanish, um, about not just human trafficking, but missing persons in Mexico and everything that goes into finding them. Um, we had uh, Teresa Ruiz, who was uh, – I, 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 I'm really big on her because she's in Mo, and she's hilarious yeah. in Mo, but she was there last night, and literally the only question I wanted to ask her was about Mo. <laughs> she did uh, an incredible breakdown about how she's been part of these searches for people even before uh, she became an actress and how the movie hmm. itself, the director – she is the daughter of the lead actress and the father in the movies, her father and the brother in the movies, her brother. And it's this whole family dynamic and that the movie is done in a way, whereas the lead actress is searching for her daughter. The people she comes across aren't actors. They're real people who are also part of these groups who have been searching for people and they're missing loved ones. And even after uh, they find their loved ones, they continue because they know that there's still other people missing. And the whole point of the movie is how many people can you get together to make some noise so that you can be heard? Um, hmm. Again, it's just uh, uh, Chicago's always been really great at bringing these movies that come from other places that you don't know when they're going to have uh, screenings, showings, you know, until they get picked up on Netflix like this one has. Uh, it's one of the big reasons why streaming has been, been so profound as, as much as people are like, oh, it gets lost in the way, it gets lost in the road. At least it's there, I guess, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, well, particularly for the foreign film festivals. Yeah, particularly for the foreign films, I feel like streaming has been like huge. Uh, I, I know I've personally been able to see so many more uh, international films since getting access to the streamers and particularly like when you prepare for the Oscars and stuff like that. It's just way, way easier than it once was. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the more of the pluses and benefits of our of our living through the streaming revolution. But Alcaraz yeah. was another one that's Spain submission. I didn't realize it was picked up by movie. They were nice enough to send us a movie link. Had to wake up super mm. early in the morning because it expired really quick. But like, yeah, you movie is another great streaming service that's been able to provide a lot of these movies that you wouldn't be able to reach. But again, I highly recommend if you're in the area to check out any of the movies. That it's still going up until Sunday. Like I said, try to check out stuff at the Music Box, the AMC River East. 
I've never seen a movie at the Gene Siskel Center, and I still can't because the schedule won't oh, allow no. it. Damn, those are comfortable seats. We got to do the press conference there uh, yeah. for the pre-fest. But, um, yeah, you have different theaters to go see movies at. You have some online selections, which you can catch as well. You can buy individual tickets to that. Or you can buy a $60 pass to the shorts, which are not geo-blocked at all. That was one thing I was hmm. looking at Sundance. Sundance has claimed nothing is geo-blocked for the upcoming year, which I'm like, <laughs> you ain't even need a VPN for that. So, awesome. Uh, we haven't started the shorts yet, but uh, I will say this. Every single time we check out the shorts in Chicago – they end up playing at Sundance. They end up nominated for Oscars. So they're really good at picking the shorts as well. Um, I just want to wrap up because, like, as Zach said, I have another screening that I'm going to yep. immediately after this. We got five more movies today, and somehow I got to fit Till in somewhere. Um, but some of the upcoming ones for this week, like uh, Zach had mentioned, we will be covering all of New York next week because I will be watching Women Talking. Yeah. Uh, that is going to be on the Let's horizon. Let's go. Zach got to catch that one, I think, back at TIFF, to be honest with you, yep. right? Yep. And I have heard nothing but great things. I believe the director is going to be there at the music box. So if you do head out over there, um, don't talk to me. Only talk to the women. Let them speak. <laughs> Let them tell their story. Uh, because along with that one, she said it's also going to be playing at the fest. I'm going to try to catch all the, all of that stuff so that we could do a whole New York talk. Mm -hmm. um, Devotion is going to be playing that I'm looking forward to. Very uh, cool. Mainly because Jonathan Majors is going to be there, and I snatch up those tickets because I really want to see the man. Hell yeah. Lucetta is another movie that I've been anticipating since Tribeca, dude. Uh, that won an award, and I'm so excited to see this one. It has a killer poster, uh, one of the alternative ones that I had seen, and it's like a, a body horror about this uh, young Mexican woman who uh, it's something to do with her having a kid or not having a kid. Uh, I, I'm anticipating that one like crazy. I'm going to be watching that one at the Music Box as well. And then Broker. It is on the horizon. Tickets Ooh, are still available. I was going to match that one up. But there's, there's so much. There's other movies that I've seen that I haven't brought up yet. So much that's still on the schedule. Have a whole other week. And it begins again in 10 minutes as I head out. But, uh, Zach, those are all the stuff from Chicago. Zach's awesome. going to have a bunch more picks from New York. See, that's my alarm already right there. Tell me to leave. Um, <laughs> Dude. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, it's always great talking the movies with you. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed Pipeline and Sick and some others. And uh, we'll, yeah. Yeah. we'll do it again when you get, you know, a few free minutes. Uh. Some sleep really is what it is. But uh, also <laughs> shout out Dragons. I'm, I'm missing this yeah. episode, but that was one that I snuck in right before the fest started. Woo! It's good. <laughs> it's good. It's, it's fantastic. It's, it's giving you that Game of Thrones oh. feeling. It's great. And, and yeah. the last minute edition, just, just completely curveball reboot. Uh, we have not been able to shout out. Yeah. I know we had early access to that one. It is uh, on Hulu. It is this whole idea of a, <laughs> a show that was a classic sitcom back in the day that is getting rebooted and they want to come at it from a different angle. But it's also very meta in the sense that it is a Hulu reboot. So there's Hulu execs being played by people in the series. Uh, I think that's a pretty funny one with a very good cast. So put that one on your radar in case you need something else. You know, in between the Abbott Elementary episodes and all the other sitcoms that are playing, that's a pretty good one to add. But I will be watching a couple more movies for today, Zach. You have a good one. Shout Thanks. out to all of the intercuties. Um, yeah, I'm going to catch you all on the next one. All right, Bye, man. Zach. Thank you for joining us. I'll uh, I'll close it out here. Go watch some good movies. Post it, man. Take care. Peace. All right, intercuties. You're stuck with me. Uh, we're going to go through some more stuff before wrapping up this weekend. This week's weekend must watch. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the things that are new to see as we look ahead to a very exciting week of releases. Um, on uh, Actually today, I guess, I was going to say on October 17th because I haven't really been looking at the calendar enough and uh, <laughs> have trouble sometimes remembering the days. Uh, but today... Tonight, part two of The Vow premieres on HBO. This is a show that I know a lot have people, a lot of people have really, really uh, dug into a documentary series that dives into the group Nevixim. Uh, Nevixim? I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. The the cult uh, that was particularly uh, blew up in fame because of its associations with like Allison Mack and some other Hollywood adjacent people. Uh, yeah, there's more documentary to dive in on uh, HBO starting tonight. So yeah, The Vow Part 2. Uh, let me know if you've been watching it because I've heard a lot of things about it. 
I've also uh, kind of curious about Mama's Boy, uh, which is a new, I guess, documentary that is adapted from Dunstan Lance Black's memoir. If you uh, don't know, Dustin Lance Black is a fairly prominent screenwriter. He, uh, of course, is the screenwriter of Milk, but has done a bunch of other pretty notable projects. And uh, this one seems a lot more personal, a lot more based on his actual life. I think that's a, a picture of him in the uh, poster over there. So, yeah, Mama's Boy, another interesting release from HBO. That one is coming tomorrow, October 18th. On October 19th, uh, we're getting a limited release for one of the movies that I enjoyed out of the Toronto International Film Festival. And that is The Good Nurse, the new Jessica Chastain, Eddie Redmayne Netflix project about a nurse who becomes suspicious of her colleague after a series of mysterious patient deaths. Uh, this one's a pretty solid thriller about... Uh, the quest to uncover some wrongdoing while institutions try to put blockades in between you and justice. Uh, you know, it, it's an interesting movie in the ways that it illustrates how um, how organizations end up covering up nefarious actors just out of fear that they'll face some of the repercussions. And basically how these these big organizations can kind of continue to reap harm on pe regular people just in the just to try to like avoid bad pr um it's not necessarily like the the greatest thriller or the most innovative you know uh, novel idea out there but it's effective i think it's well directed by tobias lindholm who has done some good stuff i would recommend it um, especially if you are a Jessica Chastain fan. It is out in limited release in theaters this week before it hits Netflix next week. Netflix next week. Uh, also hitting Netflix, actually this one's just hitting Netflix, not hitting theaters on Wednesday, is The Stranger. Uh, this is a new film starring Joel Edgerton. That's essentially the reason that it's on my radar. Also stars Sean Harris. Um, yeah, I don't know. Joel Joel Edgerton, one of my one of my favorite kind of like under the radar actors. I don't think he gets thrown in a lot of those like best working actor discussions out there. He just hasn't necessarily had a lot of the biggest opportunities. Saw him recently in Master Gardener out of New York Film Fest, and he's excellent in that. So hoping uh, hoping he'll be good in this as well. So yeah, uh, The Stranger out on October nineteenth. Uh, looking a little bit further to October twentieth, uh, one is one of us is lying. Season two hits Peacock. I don't really know much about this show, but I kind of like its title. Uh, and apparently, they're still lying because it's season two now. Then on October twentieth, Shutter gets one of the buzzy horror films of this spooky season, VHS ninety nine, the latest in the VHS series, these anthology horror films that come from a pretty interesting collection of directors. Among the directors this time around is Flying Lotus. I don't know, that sounds kind of dope um, as he seems to be sort of like venturing further towards the film world. Uh, love his music. Need to check out some of his movies, I guess. So I don't know. Um, I'm a bit hit or miss on the VHS movies. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, especially like a lot of the small ideas. Some of them work and some of them don't, but uh, I have heard that this one's actually pretty gnarly and pretty fun. So if you like that sort of thing, uh, it is available on Shudder on Thursday, but Friday is a big, big day for new releases. Man, there's so many. Uh, let's see if I can get through all of them and not have my computer fail out on me uh first up is one that i have yet to catch and i promise you i will catch it by the time that we speak next because i'm very very excited to finally see after sun something that i've been hearing from many many people is among their favorite films of the year directed by charlotte wells this film premiered at con earlier this year it had stops in toronto and new york so again all on me for not catching it but it is out Friday, at least in a limited release, before it starts to expand. Uh, the film led by Paul Mescal about a uh, 
a girl reflecting on her holidays with her father. Um, I don't know. It's got people. People don't want to get too specific with me on on what's going on in this movie. They they just tell me to experience it, just to enjoy it. And uh, I don't know. It seems like a good one. Seems like people are are really into this one. I should maybe add uh, the clip of it to the stream. Uh, Connor, one of our our loyal inner cuties, talking it up a lot. Um, I saw Austin Burke, a uh, friend of friend of the pod, Austin Burke at the New York Film Festival, and I think he said that it was his favorite film of all the uh, festival stuff he's seen. Uh, I think uh, Cole from Oscar Expert also said it might be his favorite of the year. So, man, a lot, a lot of love for uh, After Sun. Definitely, we'll catch up with that soon. Uh, also, let's talk about Argentina, 1985. This one is going to be available on prime video very soon um it's going to be available globally as well and i think this is one that uh might be argentina's submission for best foreign this year i don't know uh but it's got some good buzz out of toronto so i'm curious to check this one out i believe we were talking with uh, our argentinian inner cutie julieta before and she was saying that uh it is about subject matter that is very like niche to argentina so she sort of was doubting whether or not an international audience would like vibe with the story or something but it got some good reviews out of toronto so uh, i'm curious to check that one out on friday we're also getting the theatrical release of all that breathes this is the first documentary to win top prizes at both sundance and con and then it also went on to play at toronto and new york uh all the big film festivals are following this documentary and uh if i'm being completely honest i'm not a hundred percent sure why this is the one that's really broken through it's it's an excellent documentary i'm not trying to take anything away from it it's just not necessarily a film that i responded to more than some of the other like amazing documentaries that are out there it's good for sure and i hope you all catch it uh it's the story of these brothers who are trying to uh protect a bird called the black kite in an environment that has escalating uh air pollution it, it, it's a really interesting film that balances this sort of like familial story with this conservation effort um really good i i apparently all the top jurors at film festivals think so too so all that breathes um definitely check that out uh, what else do we have this weekend? Um, as I said, there's so much coming out. So, so much. That was just the A's. I didn't even get through didn't get to the B's. Let's start the B's with the Banshees of Inisherin. That one is finally out. I don't know why I'm saying finally because I only saw it a couple weeks ago. But I guess I'm just excited for everybody else to catch it in limited release. Uh, maybe my favorite movie of the year. If not, it's very close to it uh, from Martin McDonough with Colin Farrell, Brendan Gleeson, Kerry Condon, Barry Keegan. Just a hilarious existential comedy about two friends and one of them decides they don't want to be friends anymore. I, I cannot recommend this one enough. I really, really loved Banshees of Inisherin. Uh, even the people I know who did not love it as much as I did like it a lot. So, you know, take that for what, what it's worth. And catch it. I am very excited to hear some inner cutie reactions to the Banshees of Inisherin. I have a feeling most of you will probably be seeing Black Adam this weekend. It's the big superhero release of the weekend starring Dwayne Johnson, who has been like circling this part for like 16, 14 years, something like that. I think I, I saw a news story that dated back to 2007 when he was first approaching this idea. Um, I think the trailers for this one look kind of bad, if I'm being completely honest. Uh, just a little bit like, <laughs> just like poorly written in a way that it's like appealing to the worst 12 year old boy, you know, but, but I say, I have heard some initial reactions from press who saw the press screenings that were kind of favorable. Some people liked it. I've heard some comparisons to, uh, Zack Snyder cinematography so look i mean if you are hyped on these kind of movies if you want to see a big badass superhero film uh they're hyping up a cameo that happens too if that's the kind of thing that gets you into the theater black adam is there for you this weekend uh, i will probably catch it i don't know are we gonna go catch it caitlin no yeah well, i guess 
with A-List, it makes it a little bit easier. Um, a movie that I already did catch that played Sundance earlier this year, Brainwashed, Sex, Camera, Power. Uh, not a film that I liked very much. Uh, we talked about it more in our Sundance video if you want to go back and, and hear why we didn't really sp respond to this one. But I thought it was a very interesting idea in analyzing the way in which uh, the history of film and all these movies are, are sort of influencing the way that we view uh, people. I just kind of feel like a lot of its arguments are a little bit phony and a little bit outdated. Uh, but Nina Menke's, the director, is very respected. Definitely has a lot more respect in film analysis communities than I do. So uh, maybe you should ignore my opinion, Amanda's opinion, Art's opinion, the opinion of a lot of other people that I read and, and just watch this documentary. I don't know. Uh, a better documentary out of Sundance. Uh, one that I definitely can full heartedly recommend is Descendant. This is a new film that's hitting Netflix on Friday about a town called Africatown in Mo uh, Mobile, Alabama, that uh, has a lot of descendants of slavery in it and was reportedly the destination of the last illegal slave ship, the Clotilda. Um, and there's sort of all these stories about it, all this historical uh, debate about it. Uh, the documentary goes into that and so into a lot more. Uh, really fascinating film. Um, yeah, definitely one that I think is going to be a consideration, in consideration for the best documentary feature at the Oscars later this year. So put that one on your radar, especially it's going to be right on Netflix. It won't be hard to find. Uh, very, very good movie. Also available in theaters. So maybe check your local art, art house. You might be able to uh, catch a really good documentary on the big screen. By policeman. Every Harry Styles fans um, most anticipate a new film. My policeman is out in limited release on Friday. Uh, I think it'll be out on Amazon Prime Video in like two, three weeks. So you shouldn't have to wait that long for it. Uh, it is about uh, a relationship at a time when homosexuality was illegal. And I, unfortunately, I kind of feel like this one just doesn't really have enough there. I feel like there are other films that cover similar territory that have more nuance, have more depth to their characters. This one, honestly, to me, just feels a bit like a pop culture curiosity, like the, the main reason for its existence and its hype and its whatever is the idea that this this actor harry styles this pop culture figure harry styles is sort of leaning into the sexually ambiguous territory that he's publicly flirted with in a while and like it's it, it's interesting i guess that he's choosing to do this with his career but like also the movie is like very chaste as are most mainstream romances and there's not a whole lot of like titillation to be found there if that's even the thing that gets you in the door so I don't know. Uh, he's also not very good in the movie, which which doesn't help it either. So not a great movie, not great performances. think you can maybe wait on My Policeman, although I'm sure some people won't. Some people will be definitely checking that one out. Uh, one that, at least according to Arturo, I think people should be checking out is another South by Southwest film, The Pez Outlaw. Uh, I, I recently asked... Art and Alina, when they were here in New York, uh, if I should try and catch up with it. And they, like, before I even finished the sentence, both looked at me and went, yes! Like, they they really, really liked this movie out of South by Southwest uh, about a guy who, um, I don't know. I don't I don't even really know. Um, I'm not going to try and summarize it without really knowing. But I've heard good things. Maybe check it out in theaters or on VOD uh, this weekend. There's still more. I'm, I still got more to work through because it is a big release. We're starting to get into a busy season at the movie theater. Why they couldn't just put some of these movies out in the doldrums of August, I don't know. Um, you know with its next one, Raymond and Ray, they were at least waiting to give it a premiere at the Toronto Film Festival. But I think most of the reviews on Raymond and Ray were not great. Middling, at least. Uh, that that's not the best letterbox curve right there. I was curious because like I like Ewan McGregor, I like Ethan Hawke. They star as half brothers. Dope. That that's you got you got two great actors at least, but uh, not so sure 
that this was the project suited for their talents. Although I'll probably catch up with it now that it's going to be available uh, at home because it is an Apple TV Plus release. Very easy to just watch that one uh, from the comfort of your couch. Um, Sophia is another film that is out, although this one is just in theaters. I do want to put it on the radar, even though I'm sure most people won't get a chance to catch it yet. Uh, it comes from co-director Crystal Moselle, who we've shouted out a lot on the podcast because she's the person behind uh, Skate Kitchen, which we like a lot, The Wolf Pack, which we liked a lot, Betty, which was on HBO and we liked a lot. Uh, this one is an interesting documentary about AI and this uh, AI creation, Sophia. So, uh, it, you know, definitely covering territory of like increasingly important material uh, as we move more and more towards using AI uh, in more and more uncomfortable ways. I don't know. So. Sophia is another option out there, but I think the one that I'm maybe the new release that I'm most excited for, aside from After Sun, is Ticket to Paradise. Because I love a fun rom com. And this looks like a fun rom com. I don't know. Uh, you got George Clooney and Julia Roberts who have who are like titans of the genre reuniting here. Uh, and it just I don't know. It, it seems like a delightful time. I'm, I can use a little bit of delight and lightheartedness after two months of film festival depression dramas. I don't know. Uh, I, I just think this is going to be a good time. I, it's also got Caitlin Deaver in it, Billy Lord in it. I'm hopeful. I don't know about the rest of y'all, but I am hopeful. So that, I think, covers just about all the movies that I have on my radar, at least for the next week of release, uh, talking about our picks for the week a little bit here. Uh, you know, we are, have been trying to put together this guide for everyone uh, over on the Instagram uh, that every week you can go and just check out the, um, the picks that Arturo and I make in a way that doesn't mean you have to dig through the show notes and dig through uh, all the time codes to see what we said. Here are just our, our big picks for the week. I, I'm usually picking five. Arturo's picking five. Um, Arturo talked a couple, about a couple of his before he had to hop off the stream. So I will uh, let me throw those on now because uh, he mentioned some scary stuff for the Halloweens. What am I saying? The Halloween's um, scary stuff for spooky season. That's what I should have said. Uh, so he got piggy in there, which is a theaters and VOD pick. He had that uh, bitch ass in there too, which I want to say is a VOD. Maybe somebody can correct me there. And then sissy as well. Another South by Southwest pick which is out on VOD. Um, he also shouted out Reboot, the comedy over on Hulu uh, with Rachel Bloom, Keegan-Michael Key, Paul Reiser. Pretty good cast on that one. I've been wanting to catch up with it. And, of course, House of the Dragon, which is continuing its run on HBO. Uh, one of the best seasons of TV out there right now. So those are Arts 5 picks. Uh, if I'm going to get into my own, I, I mentioned earlier, After Sun. I am extremely excited to check that one out in theaters um, when it is released this weekend. I've, I've heard it's... I've just heard nothing but great things. So rather than empty praise, I want to see the movie and actually talk about it. Uh, what else is there? All that breeds now that that's available. Anytime a movie gets the pat on the head from both Sundance and Khan, then also gets selected by Toronto and New York. I mean, I think that's pretty assured that you're dealing with some something pretty good. So uh, hopefully that's on your radar as well. The Banshees of Inisherin, great movie amazing movie that one should probably be on number one on this list but because it's in limited release <laughs> banshees of limited in uh because it's in limited release i'll maybe put it a little further down and put it over there um and then uh 
the good nurse as it begins. Or you know what? I'm going to switch it up. We're going to go with Atlanta. I need to catch up on episode six. LaShawn in the stream is saying that episode six was good. We'll talk about it next week. But the first five episodes of this fourth season have been excellent. I talked about that last week on Weekend Must Watch. Atlanta is really, really good right now. So shout out to Atlanta and shout out to Ticket to Paradise, which I'm catching a screener of tomorrow night. Uh, I will be hot out the theater and ready to give my takes. So maybe check out my my Twitter or something and I'll let you know uh, whether or not I, I enjoyed the experience with George Clooney and Julia Roberts. So yeah, there you go. Those are 10 picks for stuff you can watch right now. A lot of spooky season clips uh, picks there too. Right now, we will end up putting that out on our uh, social media this week, closer to the closer to Friday. So uh, make sure you're following us, doing all the good stuff. But I think that's about all for this edition of the weekend must watch on Intercut. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be back hopefully soon. Uh, you know, Art still got Chicago Film Fest. Uh, oh shoot, my camera is unplugged. All right, can we hear me? <laughs> um, no, we can't see me, but can we hear me? All right, well, It's only hard the first time. Bye, everyone. <laughs>